he is the person who handles our point of interest today, which surrounds comorbidities. Dr. Amrish Mittal is an alumni of KGM Sri Lucknow and has been awarded Madhav Bhushan by the government of India. He is presently serving as the chairman of endocrinology in the Max Group of Hospitals. And we are so, so lucky to have him with us. Thank you, Dr. Mittal. I know and we all know how busy you are. You are chock-a-block full and we are so, so grateful that you are here with us today to help clear up our doubts and to talk to the doctors as well as the people of Meghalaya so that we are able to move forward. Dr. Mittal, thank you for being with us. I take hand over the podium to you. Thank you very much, uh, Karim. Thank you very much, Dr. Lohrasi, and the other doctors for inviting me here. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be with all of you. And if I can be of any little help, uh, or if my inputs can help even like 1%, 2% in combating this deadly virus, uh, I think uh, it'll be worthwhile. It's, uh, it's, it's really an honor that you chose me for this. And uh, as I was telling Dr. Pakrasi that the last travel I did before this, this ghastly virus struck us was in February of 2020. And that was to your beautiful city of Shillong. And uh, it was a one day trip as usual, and Dr. Pakrasi is well aware of those. But uh, the fact is that uh, uh, it was uh, enlightening, and I really went, wanted to go back, but then maybe once all this is over. Thank you very much for having me. I'll be happy to participate in this. So, uh, Dr. Mittal, if you could start off by you know, addressing some of the issues which surround COVID in general as regards diabetes and other endocrinology diseases and you know like there are a lot of people who uh, somehow it seems that this uh, you know the fact that we are going out I mean in the state itself you know they are very good at isolating cases and not uh, finding cases and uh, uh, you know they, but it seems to be having a double-edged sword like you know people feel that if they have diabetes, if they have any comorbidities, then, you know, they should not go out and uh, vaccinate themselves. And they feel that, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't tell people when we get sick or if we are, you know, they don't even get tested sometimes because they feel they'll get whisked away by the government and they'll get isolated and they'll get separated from their families. So if you could just tell them a little bit, you know, like, uh how why is it important for people to come forward get tested see that they have the disease know that they have it and control their comorbidity conditions so uh i think the important part we faced this a lot last year in the first wave uh, facing a little less this year because people were concerned that if they announce that they are positive then they will be as you said a force to isolate themselves from their near and dear ones and, you know, stay in a separate area or uh, initially it was even hospitalization for all positive cases, but then that quickly changed when the numbers increased. So I think it, COVID is not a stigma. Most of the time, it's not your fault you got COVID. It's a bad virus that is circulating, coronavirus. And, and sometimes despite best precautions, we may catch it. Although it is true that if you're really careful, and we'll discuss what that care is, then you can protect yourself to a large extent from catching the bug. However, if there is any suspicion, it makes no sense to hide it. You absolutely must get your test done because you could be A, you could be landing up in serious complications and then unnecessarily have to, you know, you might expose yourself to more serious conditions uh, in the sense that you could, your lungs could get damaged and so many things could happen and you don't realize it and you're just thinking it's sort of a mild fever. But that's one part. A very few of you will go on that track. So 85% of you will not go on that track. 85% of people who get COVID infections don't go on that track. But that is one, at least you should be aware. But I think even more important is the fact that you can spread the disease to others. How do you how do you ultimately get rid of this virus or this pandemic is by not allowing it to spread. 
and unless you are no if you know that you have covid and you have to isolate yourself for x number of days follow the protocols you will go on spreading and even if you escape the seriousness of the disease somebody else in your family someone very uh, you know close to you especially older patients older family members can actually catch the virus uh, very quickly so it is important that we come forward get a diagnosis if required isolate ourselves as i said for both reasons we are under surveillance and most of us will not require anything except some paracetamol and maybe some antihistamine at the same time if we are deteriorating we would know the parameters how to measure our oxygen you know those those particular things the doctors will tell us and b very importantly to protect our families so i think there is it, it actually it, it's understandable because it's it's a disruptive kind of uh, as compared to other diseases this is kind of disruptive so you suddenly uh, land up with uh, you know the main thing is being isolated from your family members but i think that is a small price to pay for the gains that we have so i would strongly encourage people to get tested uh, confirm the diagnosis and follow covid protocols you know dr mithil uh, one thing i'm hearing from the doctors over there is that uh, last time people were more scared the lockdown was more strict and uh, you know not a lot of people got sick so they feel oh we did all that and nothing happened to any of us but i don't think that we can stress this enough there is a difference between the old variant and this variant so could you tell people you know that why is it that they still have to be scared it doesn't mean that we didn't get sick last time so we won't get sick this time you know <coughs> that's uh, certainly uh, not true that if we didn't get sick last time we won't get sick this time the second wave of the covid-19 of the coronavirus was driven by the delta variant there is no doubt that the delta variant is more infectious than others so it spreads much more rapidly and therefore and we've seen that in delhi and dr patras is here we've seen that in delhi how rapidly it spread family after family 15 people 16 people 11 people everyone got infected the last uh, last year 2020 the the spread that we had was not so wide it it was still curtailed still manageable look at the number of cases that that are being reported for example we were reporting four to five times in fact five times more cases this year and even if you know even if you believe the numbers on face value still there were about five times of last year so this this variant is highly infectious it may or may not be more lethal but the sheer numbers are so many that there is no way that we can take uh, last year's example we could learn from that and i will tell you what has changed between last year and this year but quite clearly this delta variant which caused this outbreak at least in uh, in delhi and bombay and other major cities uh, what is is definitely more infectious and you know last time if one person got it the other person in the family escaped something else happened this time it's everyone when we say variant what do we mean we mean that the virus all viruses tend to mutate which means they they are fighting for survival so they keep coming back after mutation sometimes the mutations lead them to reduced uh, virulence sometimes enhanced virulence but in general they tend to increase the transmissibility so the virus mutated and there's so many mutations hundreds of them but only a few are mutations of concern or the virus is being variants of concern so this delta virus is definitely one of those we had one that was first found in south africa one in brazil one in uk and this is the uk variant that actually started the first wave here but then um, it was rapidly overcome by uh, the 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 delta virus so i think we need to be aware that uh, if last year we got away scot free i'm sorry it doesn't ensure that you will it will be the same this year now uh, so i just tell our viewers 
that uh, you know we are on facebook live and we are on youtube and uh, you can either email your questions or you know you can just go on facebook and type it there's somebody attending those channels all the time we want you to talk to dr vittal because this is the whole idea of having this session you need to learn about the disease only if you learn about the disease will you stop being scared of it only if we are scared less scared of this disease will we know what to do and if we know what to do then together we will be able to overcome it so dr mithil i just wanted to you know pick your brain i don't know why why do you think that everywhere else the positivity rate has gone down but in meghalaya the positivity rate seems to be hovering around 8 10 11% is it because we are only testing those people who are sick is it because we are reporting or i mean what do you think well, there could be multiple reasons but it's also true that the way the wave hit delhi and and you are here yourself uh it had to go down like that because it infected almost everybody in its path and if the rise is slower the decline will also be slower so i i as far as i am aware i don't think meghalaya got hit in the way that that some of the cities like delhi and parts of up and other parts mp uh, they they they've gotten it so when the virus comes on suddenly in a burst and infects lots of people then it also goes off suddenly you know whereas here uh, probably what's happening it's progressing slowly not at its same steepness of curve and therefore it will probably go off slowly also which actually gives you a chance to implement preventive measures and yes. and prevent the spread i guess we should be grateful for this opportunity that we have you know to prepare ourselves and to respond better but i think we will bring uh, dr flora marak and uh, after that dr taryang so that you know they can directly tell you how, what their experiences have been on the ground so dr flora welcome to the program and uh, please uh, you feel free to talk to dr mithil and ask him anything if you like thank you dr pakras for this time and let me tell you an absolute honor it is to be in sharing a screen with such a, a such a noted person I, thank you so much for this time and uh, i i hope i will not take much of your time from the experiences we've had in my in uh, in in our field in my time working in the field uh, people uh, are still hesitant to come forward like you said so it's very true that they still hesitant to come forward and test themselves they fear uh, sec like they fear stigma they fear oh if i get if i get tested positive i will be sent away and uh you know i i will not be able to see my family and what if i die in that situation what if i don't see them anymore so uh it's true that uh they are scared of the disease uh and then they're equally scared of staying away from their families so that is what's keeping them it's it's like a a seesaw situation so like at at one point they want to be with their family and at the other point uh they're like uh the bite is positive what uh, if i go and check myself uh, so i think that is also contributing to a lot of hesitancy in terms of testing as well as vaccination and there are lots of rumors surrounding this vaccinations uh, re regarding certain things like uh, it is it is like uh, it is uh, causing infertility among women is not good for pregnant ladies is not it is not good for elderly people or those or those with poor morbidities so those uh, people are coming late and when they when they come late to us with with that infection it is difficult to bring them out of it so we've been trying a level best you know sir to uh, encourage them to come forward we 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 have the extensive iecs we have extensive programs on this uh, but uh, somehow or the other something seems to be hindering these people uh, to coming uh, to come forward and you know uh, express themselves or get themselves vaccinated or get themselves tested so i hope through these programs and through uh, such dignitaries as yourself so we are able to reach to this population and you know give give them some sort of hope that you know working together uh, in any way possible we will be able to overcome this pandemic and come to somewhat somewhat near normalcy so that, that's all we can do do you have any questions for dr uh, uh yes sir. uh i'll take this time to ask a few questions regarding uh thyroid disorders sir. especially uh, since i'm working in a maternity hospital the concerns are more relating to the pregnant ladies of course in general as well so i would like to ask you sir like how does this infection uh, and the disease thereafter affect people with underlying thyroid disorders in general as well as in pregnant ladies 
and uh, the importance of vaccination in such people, sir. I, I, would, I would really like you to clear on that, sir. So I think, uh, Dr. Marak, you've raised several very important points, and I'll address them all one by one. Uh, one is about vaccination. The first is that our, what is the way to get rid of this pandemic? It is through follow COVID appropriate behavior. Again, we'll probably come back to that, which means masking and physical distancing. But equally important to get vaccinated, as much of the population gets vaccinated, the better, you know, the, the larger the population that's vaccinated, the better it is for us. And if you want to kill the pandemic, then you have to actually vaccinate very, very large numbers of the population. So that is number one. So we vaccination is a tool to protect ourselves and we absolutely have to use that. And it's not being smart if we are not. There are natural fears about any new vaccine, any new intervention, which is given to normal people, you know, because they're otherwise normal. They're taking a vaccination. So the, the risks of vaccination are very low, very low, you know, and, and except the fever, a little bit of body ache, arm soreness, etc., that you may get, the risks of actual serious disorders happening after vaccination are minuscule. The vaccination is meant for people with comorbidities. So if people with diabetes and people who are elderly, who are elderly and who have comorbidities, who are the prime sort of target in the sense that they are the most susceptible to complications of COVID, if that group does not get vaccinated, the whole purpose is, is lost. So, in fact, the high priority groups for vaccination, as you saw the government program, is for those above 60. Now, those above 60 is, are the patients where the bulk of people, where the bulk of comorbidities are clustered. Therefore, vaccination for those with diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, even cancer, is absolutely, absolutely recommended. No question about that. The very, very rare cases of blood clots that have been reported about after some vaccines are exceedingly rare and really, unless someone has a clotting disorder, you need not uh, worry about it at all. You, you know, you, when you pop a pill, when you pop an aspirin for a day, you can get a fatal bleeding. You know that? When you take the most innocuous pill, an antihistamine, you can get a bad reaction. So that chance of a reaction is always there. Don't, don't sort of stay away from vaccination for those very, very rare uh, situations. Please get vaccinated. Thyroid disorders are very common. Thyroid disorders, people with thyroid disorders have absolutely no greater risk of either COVID or of any vaccination side effects. So thyroid disorders of people are because it's autoimmune. Some people worry, I've got an autoimmune thyroid disorder, etc. Nothing like that. A thyroid disorder will not make you more prone to COVID. It's not one of those comorbidities that makes you more prone to COVID, nor is it one of those that makes you more likely to get a vaccine reaction. So please, unless you have had a reaction to any childhood vaccine or you have an acute allergy history where, you know, you got acute allergy like anaphylaxis with some particular food, in which case we should tell the uh, vaccinator. Otherwise, there is no reason not to take the vaccine. So this is incredibly, if we, if we don't take vaccines now, we are really inviting the virus to stay amongst us. The more it stays, the more it mutates, the more dangerous it becomes. So vaccine hesitancy has to go out and in a place as evolved and as educated as Meghalaya, they should actually be leaders in this. And you should lead the country in 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 defying the vaccine hesitancy and become get vaccinated get very high proportion of the population vaccinated i think this is very very important uh, the thing about about uh, whether people should announce it or not yes i think it's again important i'll emphasize the point again most of us most of you will recover recover uneventfully after covid so most for most of you it's just a caution and the fact that at least you know you're not going to spread the virus if you're isolated properly. There's no, there's no magic medication for either preventing COVID or preventing the spread. It's basically physical isolation. So it's not a stigma at all. 
There's nothing about it as stigma. I mean, that way, all of Delhi is stigmatized. I think Dr. Karin will agree that almost everyone we know got some form of COVID or the other, even sometimes, you know, uh, in very strange situations and you couldn't figure out why and how, but it happened. So, so therefore, it's not a stigma at all. You must get yourself tested if at the slightest symptom, report to your doctor. And vaccination is a 100% uh, uh, sort of... Uh, that's the, in fact, the only way we vaccinate out this virus. That's the only way. And pregnancy also now it has been approved. Uh, pregnant women now can get vaccinated. It always was there, but government was obviously, because there are not enough trials in pregnancy, <clears throat> there is no real concern about safety. So you can go ahead with that, no problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Mittal. I really, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Dr. Flora. You know, uh, I really appreciate what you said. And I think this should be the thing that should ring out amongst all the people. That in a state like Meghalaya, where everybody is so educated, why are we being hesitant about taking the vaccine? I can't understand it. So let's say it again and again and again. We have to be the leaders. We have to show people that we are educated enough to know that the vaccine is going to protect us. Kumba Iongi Dr. Mittal, Lada Pishim Yeganega vaccine, Nila Ban Yang Lang, Ban Pan Lem Yeganega Jing Pang, Lada Pikwa, Ban Let Biang Shapar, Ban Le Yaki football, Ban Le Basketball, Ban Yer Long Festival, Ban Long Ban Yai Sodong Sodong, Pide, Ban Vaccinate Yala Day. Lada 70% Jonka population at least Ladangi La Ban vaccinate Lang in Yang divided we fall and united we stand. Let us unite in going out and getting ourselves vaccinated. This is our responsibility. So just in case you have forgotten what the steps are, here are just a few reminders for you about how you can prevent yourself from getting the disease. Do you know the COVID-19 disease can be stopped by you and me? Together, we can do this. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth as much as possible. Wash your hands with soap more frequently. Maintain social distancing and keep a distance of at least six feet apart. Most importantly, wear double mask at all times. One surgical mask and a cloth mask on top. If you have symptoms like cough, fever, diarrhea, fatigue, shortness of breath or loss of taste and smell, Contact your nearest health center immediately or you can call the toll-free number 14410 for any assistance. Issued in public interest by National Health Mission, Government of Meghalaya. So you heard what she said. Let's fight this disease together. Again, I'm going to call on Dr. Mittal to just give us, you know, like a few pointers. Uh, Dr. Mittal, you know, some people ask, okay, I can't get uh, COVID shield. Should I take Covaxin? Does it really matter? You know, people are worried that, okay, this uh, vaccine is better, that vaccine is better. Do you think that it really matters? And as long as you get vaccinated, does the kind of vaccine that you take matter? Because, you know, travel restrictions, this, that, so I think uh, that's a very, very relevant question, uh, Karine. And basically, we are looking at the fact that actually India is fortunate because many developing countries have no access to vaccine or very limited. We are always comparing ourselves with the more developed countries, which is correct, actually, because that's how you move up. And we say that, you know, they vaccinated so many, they vaccinated so many. But the fact is that we are blessed because we have access to vaccines more than others. It's still not sufficient, but it's much more than many other countries. So that's number one. Number two, these vaccines have all been developed at breakneck speed, literally. Never in the history of mankind have vaccines been developed so fast. 
So which one vaccine is superior to the other will take many years to figure out. That is not important for us. Why is it not important? Every vaccine that is in use and in India, Covishield and Covaxin and now Sputnik, and I'm sure you'll have others, maybe Moderna very soon, they are all effective against some aspects of the disease. What is that? All the vaccines in use reduce the risks of hospitalization drastically by 90-95%. They reduce the risk of serious disease again in those numbers. And they reduce the risk of death very substantially. So all these vaccines reduce the risk of serious disease very, very substantially. Now, on the other hand, some people may argue that the vaccine effectiveness or efficacy is 63% for one, 77 for the other, et cetera, et cetera. That is judged by symptomatic infections, which means that supposing I've got the vaccine, as compared to someone who doesn't have the vaccine, what are my chances of getting a cough, cold, fever kind of symptom? So while the efficacy in that may vary, some vaccine may reduce that risk by, you know, by 77%, some by 68%, some by 80%. But the efficacy of these vaccines in preventing death, preventing serious disease, is about the same at the moment. That's what the data indicates. So as I said, we are lucky to have access to various vaccines, whichever one is lined up for you, whichever one is accessible for you, just go ahead. Do not worry about Covaxin versus Covishield versus this. Now, there are travel issues, as, as Kareem mentioned. So that, of course, is an issue. You'll have to see that. We are hoping that Covaxin also gets uh, 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 approval. We are also hoping that the Covishield and the, and the AstraZeneca thing is sorted out and most of EU approves that. I think that will, in the due course of time, be sorted out. But for disease prevention, and especially for prevention of serious disease and death, it is very important you take whichever vaccine is available to you without any hesitation. So another thing, uh, Dr. Mittal, that, uh, you know, we are facing is this constant conversation about the third wave. So, uh, you know, there is this thing about like how you can avoid the third wave if you vaccine vaccinate enough people. So this is a very important conversation for us to have because this is another reason why we need to get vaccinated. Because the more people get vaccinated, the better we'll be able to the better chances we have of avoiding a thought group. Uh, what, are, uh, what do you have to say about that? Absolutely. Uh, I agree 100%. Because what is the purpose of vaccination? The purpose of vaccination is not treatment. It is preventing the spread of disease and preventing serious disease. If we develop immunity to the virus, even if it's partial, even if it's a new variant, when you are vaccinated, you know, in the gap between two waves is the time to fill the population up with vaccination. Just jab everybody. If you can do that, you are really protecting yourself from the third wave. I think that is uh, very important. The problem that happened in India, why it all went topsy-turvy was also, in addition to whatever else might have been the reason, there were two reasons why it went completely crazy in India, in, in, especially in the larger cities and all, uh, in the months of April, particularly April and May. And the reason was, firstly, that there was this variant that came in, right? That, of course, I already said was, was very infectious and spread fast. But also it happened simultaneously as we were increasing our vaccination. That's quite crazy. I don't think in the history of mankind, humankind, if you say, uh, we've had a, a situation where you're vaccinating when the disease is surging. You vaccinate in between to prevent uh, infection. So that's why the whole vaccine thing became very confusing because people got a shot. They've already infected. They got a shot. They, before protection could kick in, they got an infection. So it was quite terrible. So that's why if our vaccinations were two months earlier or the wave started two months later, we would have been much better off. But yeah, happened, unfortunately, simultaneously. You know, That's February right. started picking up, February when our vaccinations are picking up. Yeah, so we yeah. Have in that. So now we have that chance. Now there is no excuse. Now we have this, this window where we don't know when the third wave is coming. No one knows. Everyone is speculating. I can also speculate, but it's speculation. 
But the fact is that if we are able to jab most of our people in that period, in that gap, in that breather that we've gotten, uh, I think we will be much, much better off. Much better off. And the third way, even if it infects us again, will not cause deaths, will not cause ICU overcrowdings. So you may get mild infection still, but it will not be that serious. So very, very important. Yeah, actually, that was the thing that gave, you know, partly, I think, the, the scare or the fear about getting vaccinated is this, because people were going to get vaccinated, but either they were already infected or they were getting infected by other people who are carrying the virus. So people feel that, oh, we got the vaccine and we got uh, infected. <laughs> Not a yeah, so you, if you could tell our viewers about that, and then after that, we'll get Dr. Taryang in. So there is no way that the vaccine can cause COVID. Vaccine cannot cause COVID. So if and some of our patients can correlate that, that we got the vaccine and five days later, and that is because they got infected at the vaccination center. And that's simply because at that point, the vaccine, the virus was spreading so rapidly. That is just a one off. Now you, there's no problem in any vaccination center, only for those one or two weeks where it went completely crazy where we didn't know who's infected who's not infected so the vaccine does not cause cannot cause covid so please be relaxed about it at the most it can cause a couple of days of body aches low grade fever arm pain at the injection site some people get headaches some people get dizziness but nothing think of it as a mild viral you know small price to pay and many people get nothing you know, in the same family, you vaccinate half of them don't even know they have nothing. And the other person has to miss work for one day. So so there are things like that. But absolutely, it cannot cause the COVID. Yeah, it's so funny that, uh, you know, the other day at the hospital, some people were vaccinated. They didn't feel it. They said, you don't want the vaccine for me. <laughs> so that also happens. It's so mild that, you know, people feel that they haven't got the yes, yes. They have to feel that. So this also another thing that we have to talk about that if you're going to the center and getting vaccinated obviously they're going to put the vaccine for you you know that's in the interest of the people putting the vaccine to vaccinate you rather than you know just pretend or something i don't know why people even talk about this it's quite strange so anyway now we'll just have dr taryang in and uh, uh, dr taryang uh, uh, you know uh, dr mithil is here and your, uh, you know, you are on the ground. So whatever are the problems that you are facing with uh, diabetic patients, this is your opportunity, you know, to uh, pick his brain He's in front of you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, Karin. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be among the two of the most noted medical personality who have known. And uh, actually, in our ground reality, actually this year we have seen so much mortality. Compared to last year, we're seeing so much mortality this year compared to other years, uh, last year. So actually, one thing is the most important is that people are fear of stigmatization. People are scared of being stigmatized. So they come a bit late to the hospital. And especially even people with comorbidities, they're coming very late. So actually, those are the people who require to come to the hospital early. But because of the fear of the stigmatization, they're coming a bit late. So I think we need to be clear with uh, <clears throat> that COVID is not a stigma, as Sir has said earlier. So we should not be scared of coming forward to test in order to take care of our own family members, to take care of our friends, and so that they don't get the COVID. And, uh, I have a question for you, sir. Uh, actually, I want to know regarding what is your take on diabetes on with COVID? Whether all diabetic patients suffer severe COVID or not all of them or any, there is difference between control, controlled diabetics and uncontrolled diabetics? So I think uh, that's a very relevant question. From the very first data that came out from China, it was evident that people with comorbidities, now even the man in the street knows the word comorbidities. No one had heard of it earlier except doctors. So people with comorbidities tend to have poorer outcomes. What does that mean? It means that these are sicker people, people who are sick 
have poorer outcomes with COVID. So let me give you an example. We did a, uh, we published a study on 400 uh, convicted patients uh, at the place where I work at Max, and we found that 38 percent were known diabetics. These are admitted patients. We are not talking about OPD uh, hospitalized patients. 38 percent were no, they came, yes, I am a diabetic. 9% didn't know they were diabetic and they were found to have very high sugar, like A1Cs of 12, 13, 11, you know, crazy figures. So very high blood sugar, which were pre-existing. And, and it, 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 we discovered that. Another 5, 6% didn't have anything. A1Cs are normal, but simply the stress of the virus and the infection cause them to become or uh, to have high blood sugar. So there are three reasons. Number one, just the simple, the simple stress of infection. Any viral infection can aggravate diabetes or sometimes any acute illness can cause new onset hyperglycemia. It is thought that this virus may have a specific predilection for the pancreas, pancreatic beta cell, and therefore it may be even further enhancing this. And very importantly, because steroids are life-saving sometimes in the second week of disease, when there is an inflammatory storm, at that point, the use of steroids can raise blood sugars a lot. So you already are battling stress, etc., and your body is really raising the sugar. But when you add steroid, the sugars go sky high. You know, you see numbers of 400, 500. And if you are... If you're not careful about managing those sugar values at that point, your outcomes are bound to be poor. That is what COVID does to diabetes. What does diabetes do to COVID? When you have diabetes and you get COVID, the overall the risk of, of serious disease is much higher. But I'll explain that. If you just, you cannot put all diabetes in one basket. There are, there are, there are sort of bands of diabetes. Of someone who has well-controlled diabetes, relatively younger, and no other comorbidities, hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease, their outcomes are as good as, as, a, as someone without diabetes. At the other end of the spectrum, you have someone who has had diabetes for 40 years, his kidneys are affected, eyes are affected, heart has an issue, you are likely to be more, much more vulnerable. So diabetes is not one one disease it's a band from from the left which is very mild uh, well controlled diabetes to the to the very severe with multiple disorders two more points here one is the fact that we didn't find diabetes alone as a predictor of outcomes we found the presence of other conditions like a clustering with diabetes diabetes and hypertension diabetes hypertension heart disease diabetes hypertension kidney disease diabetes and kidney disease so when you have these combinations, that's what increases the seriousness. Plain diabetes often does not. So I think uh, that is uh, important to know that that uh, the, the poor outcomes are actually often linked to comorbidities that coexist along with uh, diabetes. And also, if you are checking your blood glucose regularly, and if you keep your diabetes well controlled, and God forbid you get COVID and at that point you are in touch with your physician and you are able to manage your sugar as well, then your outcomes are not different from anybody. So there is no reason to feel that if you are a diabetic, you are going to certainly catch COVID. No, the risk of infection is not higher in diabetes. But having caught the virus, the risk of serious disease is higher. For those diabetics who are not well controlled and who have other coexisting conditions, but a well-controlled diabetic who's looking after himself or herself is managing with blood glucose regularly, checking blood pressure, making sure you're doing your little bit of exercise, eating healthy. Your risk is not very high at all. So it's very important that people call me because my patients have diabetes, or most of them, and they'll call, oh my God, now I'm gone. You know, because I've got diabetes and I'm so scared. So diabetes is no reason to get scared. It's just a reason to be more vigilant. And while we are describing these things, there is one more point I'll take this opportunity to explain. What we have learned about prevention from last year versus this year. Excessive emphasis on hand washing, hand hygiene is not required. Surface transmissions are not so common. 
So last year we were spraying the feet every time we changed the patient. You know, it was just too difficult. And the table and everything, and you again you. So now we only wash our hands after every patient, which is in any, any case. Avoid touching your face always. The important thing is the surface transmission is a very small proportion of our. It's the air transmission. So we need very good masking, not wearing a mask around the neck or in, in Delhi, no one covers their nose. They keep the mask around the face, uh, around the mouth, and they forget the nose. So, so it has to be nose and mouth and snug being fit. Like it has to be really snug. And and if you do that properly, you are protecting yourself to a large degree. Not only that, if you can avoid indoor gatherings, reduce your time spent in air-conditioned environments. If the weather is good, keep the windows open. You're, you'll be much better off. You can be, all the outbreaks have occurred in indoor environments, often air-conditioned, often where ventilation is poor. And at the same time, when we are talking about masking and distancing, ventilation is a critical point. Open air infections. If you meet your friend in the park and you're not sort of hugging each other, you're just walking along and you know both are wearing masks, the risk of infection is very low. In between Delhi, there was this whole thing about, oh, it's in the air. So keep all windows closed, keep everything closed. You know, actually, it doesn't really spread like that. Open air infections can happen, but they're quite rare. Almost all outbreaks happen indoors in poor ventilation, with poor masking, uh, you know, and, and our, you know, close, close these people talking, taking off their mask to have a cup of tea or, you know, enjoy a, a meal together. That's a problem. So I think we need to emphasize those points and not be obsessive. We have to wash our hands. Don't have to be obsessive about it because last year, half my time went only washing my hands. But now we know it doesn't really matter so much. You know, you have to wash after every patient, but not like, oh, you touch this now, again you go. Oh, I've touched the door, again I go. So don't have to be so obsessive. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, doll. I think that is a really, really important message. And I will ask uh, Dr. Flora to actually say that in Garo for our Garo viewers. And I'm going to say it once in Kasi again. Uh, yeah, Dr. Flora, if you can just say that in Garo ones yes. for our Garo viewers, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Mithil. <laughs> no, no, it's very important. That's the whole purpose. And I can see some questions in the chat box also. So whenever you want, we can. Yes, yes, that's right. So whenever you're ready, you can just answer those questions. So, so, so the questions here are, how is the treatment of COVID with steroids making the sugars? We've already talked about that. Sugars with steroids, but temporary insulin therapy is often needed and quite important to battle this. And your, your doctors will guide you through this. Not a problem. Uh, so don't be scared of insulin. If suppose, supposing you get 400, 500 sugars, when you're on steroids, the doctor cannot manage it with, that, with tablets. They will introduce insulin very often, so just follow that. It's temporary. Taking insulin once does not mean that it is going to be permanent. It does not, it is not addictive. And this is something that is so deeply sort of embedded in everyone's brain that it's like I have to get inside and pull it out. No. When you get an infection like this, it is temporary insulin usage, right? That's what, uh, and that's about then. Is this vaccine, what about long-term side effects? Very unlikely. See, no one can give you a final answer. But I think, uh, uh, you know, the scientists are not fools. There can be some differences in efficacy, but randomly anything can happen. But I don't think we are worried about long-term side effects. What will happen, my guess is, that over a period of time, a few of these vaccines will remain and the rest will drop out. You know, once the world has access to the best two or three and you don't know which are, which those, which are those right now, then they will remain and the others will probably drop out. But I don't think there's any fear of long-term side effects.
but you know uh, rare things can happen and we can't rule that out at the moment there is no such thing. Uh, this is a very very important question this this question was from van bok then van boriam van bok who asked about is vaccine is this long term and then rengoline is this current vaccine effective against the delta variant it is less effective against delta variant than it was against the native covid wild type covid virus coronavirus but it is effective again i will emphasize the efficacy in preventing deaths and admissions and serious disease is very high almost similar to the first one the efficacy in preventing infection is slightly lower so you may land land up with a cold and cough but it's unlikely that you land up in the icu uh, if you have been properly vaccinated which means in these in our vaccines two doses and two to three weeks after the second dose is when you are protected so most of the infections in delhi happened between first and second jab because as i said we just started the vaccination and boom the wave came on so so i think that's that's it so uh, there is also a question by nanpilai why, why there is no guarantee for this vaccine for the people i really can't answer that i think uh, uh, lots of vaccines when the whole world is facing a vaccine shortage except a few very rich countries so remember that uh, i don't think there is anything wrong in prioritizing and definitely those with comorbidities at over 60 should be our primary target second should be those who have who are above 45 and have comorbidities and then the government reduces it to everyone over 18 so as and when it becomes available i think it should be available in meghalaya uh, there will be maybe from time to time some shortage but lots of vaccines are coming in so if the third wave gives us some time uh, which probably it might it will then we should be able to vaccinate large proportions of our population uh the second question is actually this question is a very important question uh so pongthe is asking that people are saying that some people died after the second dose and she doesn't want to have the vaccine because uh, she has uh, uh, you know she heard that these people died and her mother is 60 plus and she has a heart pay, uh, condition so she's like can she take the vaccine so i think uh, i'm so glad these happened. questions are coming up kadin because this is exactly what patients ask us in the opd all the time so if someone died after two shots of vaccine it is not because of the vaccine it is because of the following reasons number one that either there was not enough time after the second vaccine before you got the infection so if you got it within 3 days after the second vaccination you were not protected so that's not really well enough so that is one it could also be that that person had some compromised immunity uh, beforehand was on some drugs that could cause uh you know uh, compromise their immunity like some of the doctors who we lost and who seem to be vaccinated properly they had these issues uh, even after two vaccinations because they had innate immunity problems or clotting problems that's why they succumb but if you have taken one vaccine not taking second vaccine is not okay at all it makes no sense please get your second vaccine because you are only partially protected and especially with the variants floating around it's very important that you complete your vaccination schedule please don't fear the second shot the second shot if people did succumb after that it's not because of the vaccine it's because you didn't get the body was not able to protect itself despite the vaccine for some reason either the vaccine didn't get enough time or there was underlying immune disorder so please please go ahead and get your second vaccine and for your mother it's a no brainer she is a primary she is a prime candidate for the vaccine she must get the vaccine 60 years mother heart disease absolutely get the vaccine so the, i think there's some viewers who want to uh, you know ask you some questions so uh, can we have the questions online prakash yeah a great question which again i have answered today on the phone three times since the morning on a sunday now i should i get vaccinated when should i get vaccinated if i have had covid typically it's about 3 months you can get vaccinated earlier you can get vaccinated later why because it's there's no harm in getting vaccinated earlier okay and the immunity from an infection will last typically at least 6 months so you can go even go longer 
but a midway where you are sort of maybe you're one of those who didn't develop that good immunity you maybe so 3 months is what the uh, guideline is and it's absolutely correct 3 months after recovery get your shot don't get too much into why not 4 months why not just get it at 3 months i think that's the safest it covers both things you know you get your second shot also and you also and also there is evidence that people who had covid even if they've had one shot their protection becomes pretty good so it's not a you know problem but again the same thing 3 months is a good time to get it done after you work for yeah so i have already answered that sop for vaccination of covid contracted patient i oh. have taken some dose of covid Maybe. oh <laughs> <laughs> well, I said sorry. I'm sorry. It's an unusual situation, but I think you can take your vaccine. Firstly, let me tell you, no one has done a study on this. No one will ever do a study on this. How can you do a study? But basically, it's fine. I don't think there'll be any problem. Should go ahead. So, uh, what we are saying is again, this is unclear. That in, since in first trimester we avoid everything. go for your vaccination after the first trimester this is still an evolving area maybe after some time we'll say it's not a problem uh, you know but it will be hard to get data on pregnant women uh, for some time safety is reasonably well established but to be doubly safe for yourself go for vaccination after the first trimester you know in first trimester even vitamins we are careful about so it's good to go for it after the uh, when you enter the second trimester So we now want to know: Does the COVID virus virus cause diabetes in non-COVID people, and how can diabetics protect themselves from getting COVID? Anything more than normal COVID-appropriate behavior? Not short a long question. Don't have to be sorry, Vina. So, so does the COVID virus cause diabetes? That is a subject of intense research now. It can cause rise in blood sugar in patients, but whether that leads to actual diabetes or just a transient rise in blood sugar? that is not a final answer is not available most of our patients who got high blood sugars in the first wave have come back to their baseline values now so we don't think it is a permanent damage but there is a theory that there might be and globally such cases are being collected now so it's possible uh, anything more than normal covid appropriate behavior is what i told you is controlling your parameters make sure you check your blood glucose regularly make sure you keep your hba1c which as you know is an average of last 3 months of control make sure that that is kept under 7 so so i think that is that is uh, those are the key things that are different from someone who doesn't have diabetes so g bond singh doctor after both doses i am protected for how long fantastic question unfortunately i don't have a good answer but i'll give you a, a, a practical answer because this is just being studied right now this is the main thing being studied you know and you've just read that germany and some other countries are giving booster that 6 months to 12 months already considering that and and, and preparing for october and all uh, so that they can give this a booster to their um, in general in general the period will, for these vaccines will turn out to be i guess definitely 6 months probably up to 12 months maybe little longer so i would say till the end of this year if you take in your vaccine you're fine 2022 we do we look at it again by that time we have more data on the other hand with some of the newer vaccine and that may prove to be a differential in the long term and like like with the rna vaccines it's very likely that they provide you protection for much longer so we we'll have to see how that goes but if you've taken your vaccine in 2021 at least this year don't worry about it we'll see by the time we have more data you are definitely protected for 6 months very likely protected for the full year uh, by that time we'll know if it's longer protection or not i think this is a very important question that has come up so we are running out of time and i'm going to ask uh, dr tariang and dr flora to have uh, to ask any more questions that they have but we should take this actually because this is something which a lot of people ask can a kidney transplant person who is still under medication get the vaccine it's a simple yes or no question yes sir sankita must get the vaccine 
when we say immunocompromised patients it means their response to the vaccine may be not as good as someone who is not immunocompromised okay so maybe his protection will not be as good as someone who is not but the side effects are not more so maybe you don't get 90% maybe you get 80% doesn't matter but some protection will happen people who have had transplant who are immunosuppressant uh would you say is is there any association or does, does it help as since we are in the situation we are all indoors we don't have vitamin d exposure we're all locked down so it's a it's, it's more of a question of interest only only sir so if you could just answer that thank yes, you yes uh, you that's my primary area of interest uh, is vitamin d actually and uh, i'm so glad you asked this unfortunately the answer is not simple but i'll just give you <laughs> the, the gist because yesterday i gave in gave a plenary on this in the ideacon conference in kolkata uh, i mean virtually of course uh, and it's it's a complex issue but what is the practical tip the practical tip is that vitamin d deficiency is common in indians it's particularly common in northeast because of cloud cover sometimes and sunlight not being so much therefore and there is no vitamin d in indian diets e even in the northeast there is very little vitamin d in the diet so you should take a supplement because vitamin d is important for our bone and muscle but it's also important to build our immunity it's good to take a supplement but don't overdose yourself so a dose of up to 1000 to 2000 units a day mm. well you know those things you take at 60000 units people are popping them all the time so 1 to 2000 units a day will keep you protected and safe it is likely that if you have a better d level okay not correct statement is that if you have vitamin d deficiency you are more likely to catch the virus number 1 number 2 it's not clear that if you catch the virus will your outcome be worse it's the reverse of diabetes huh? uh, in yes. diabetes uh, diabetes doesn't make you more prone to catch the virus but if you do catch it the outcome is poor in vitamin d it's not clear if it makes any difference our own study again published in nature scientific reports actually suggested that if you check the d level and looked at the outcome there was no difference regardless of the d level d level had no impact but other studies have shown that in the community if d levels are low then your chances of getting respiratory viral infections including covid are higher so it makes sense as a community to have regular low doses of vitamin d 
not stuff yourself up with vitamin D and expect that it's going to make a huge difference. But just to keep yourself healthy, to make sure that you, if you're testing the D level, clearly you make sure it's above 20 nanograms per hour. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Do, do you have anything to ask? Actually, sir, this question was asked by one of my friends. He asked, if I am obese, do am I predisposed to severe COVID? If I have, what is your take on that, sir? Obese. I, I am obese. Yes. Obesity. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, we didn't. A, a great. I think we should end with that. But that's a really important question. Uh, obesity definitely does increase the risk of uh, adverse outcomes in the same manner as diabetes. Sometimes even more than diabetes, especially if it's severe obesity. Mild obesity doesn't have an impact, but severe obesity, those who are you know grossly overweight, BMI is over 35, definitely have poorer outcomes. And among those, uh, even among the others. The, uh, those who are overweight or obese will overall tend to have poorer outcomes in the same way as diabetes because they also have more comorbidities. So, and breathing, and then, you know, re respiratory support, and chest expansion, and prone, you know, all those things that you do to manage COVID patients become harder. So, obesity is a, is a risk factor. Uh, Dr. Mithil, I just want to thank you sincerely from the people of Meghalaya as well as from the National Health Mission. It, this has been so good. You have been so you know, precise with your answers. And I think a lot of people have learned a lot of things, including the doctors, I'm sure. And we have been so lucky that we were able to have you on the show with us. I will be showing you some pictures uh, of Dr. Mithil's uh, photography. Hold on. Hold on. For that, I would like Dr. Flora to say something in uh, you know, Garo to the people of Garo Hills. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, program ko niswing ipa mandira na andam ke aratas. Kanchini dalu na sukpa ko mungsung ko pa doctor dal dal ko pa doctor kanchini na sukpa yung mga nanama nama advice ko agani ni rang ko pati ni rang ko nandok yano ni mungsa important ba mungsung bat ka mamayo ng mask ko kananian. Mask ko ganan niyan, ang ching kuya sabi siyo ni ko, 90 to 95 percent o na, ang ching ko champion rik naman na, ang ching ko naljokat naman na, ya sabi siyo ko, matrik ka o ni ba patruruan ni ko. Ang ching saksasakamun mong rogin, rogin gin si mo ba, ba saksasakamun mong grongrik gin si no ba, ang ching mask ko ganan ni grongrik ka kung ang hindi, yan, ya ang ching ko naljokat na gata na min, na min nakchak ka. Aro ang ching saksasakamun mong grong mo, Palo balwa nama o nuk nuk kekik kepepawang gija balwa nama o anci rona mana orang ni dia arus mask ko gan ok gija mask gan kue arus susah kan yang aku cakap leh anci blongin o de anci na ya batu rona ni blongin komia arus yang yang mungsung bat mana anci ni masih rekan ni ramai mask kena nangcung muta rontal lantai leh ko cakap leh nangcung muta arus je makan sabi si Dung 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 pang perang dung aja je kai diabetes je kai thyroid ah katung ni sa bakit ni ni sa bak liver ni sa nak apa sa sa perang dung cap kencing orang orang deh nak simang na ya vaksin nang cungut kepok nga shoot na nang cungut kepok nga aro ah mai mai apa kau mungkin nanti orang ni kau mungkin kena orang ni asal nasong ya aku rancak nak kencing kencing no deh ah helpline orang tau orang orang nak kai nak simang nanti ni doubt ko clear kan nama ngan aro ah Cuma naba question nak kau atat nama ngan, arus dah asal ni sepang wat kau doktor rangci aye mengna, anak si mangi kena ni rangku agan ni warangku thalat nama ngan. Uniman, ya kau nisuin pasakan ti kau amut mulat paenga vaccination kau rapa bo covid appropriate behaviour bajak shuani cetang kerja dongani mask kau ni especially double mask ti kau naga na, double masking, aru anthan aku tika shuani kau angamut mulat na skinya. Over to you, Dr. Karin. Thank you so much, Dr. Flora. I think now we'll have the pictures. Thank you so much, Dr. Mithil, for sharing them with us. But we are online. We'll meet you after we see the pictures.
<laughs> so I, I, got, uh, I got a few hours uh, after my talk in Shillong and I was, uh, you know, it was suggested, uh, I said, I want to go somewhere. That's my habit as Kerry uh, knows very well. So um, this, uh, they gave me various suggestions. I said, this sounds fantastic. Let me go to the sacred forest. And it was such a, such a unique experience, not just for the eyes, but for the soul. I really, when I go back, I want to go and spend some time there. And uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I really haven't been to uh, Shillong except once, except that one time. So maybe in the future. Thank you very you much. You have two friends in Shillong now. You can <laughs> walk at any time, Dr. Yes, Mittal. Sir. You've done us such a great service. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you, Dr. Flora. And thank you, Dr. Tariang, for being with us. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you Prakash and NHM team, Maria. And I want to thank Griseldis for all the work she does behind the scenes. Do you know the COVID-19 disease can be stopped by you and me? Together, we can do this. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth as much as possible. Wash your hands with soap more frequently. Maintain social distancing and keep a distance of at least six feet apart. Most importantly, wear double mask at all times. One surgical mask and a cloth mask on top. If you have symptoms like cough, fever, diarrhea, fatigue, shortness of breath or loss of taste and smell, Contact your nearest health center immediately or you can call the toll-free number 14410 for any assistance. Issued in public interest by National Health Mission, Government of Meghalaya. I've been working in the field of disability, specifically for children and people with visual impairment, where we try to specialize on inclusive education. I love to do my work and that's why it keeps me going, knowing that in some way or the other, I can contribute towards the life of others and also to be an inspiration to them so that, you know, they take life as it comes, they overcome the challenges and look for the best resources that we can live the life that we're meant to live. For that reason, with the pandemic, we were locked up in the house and it was a very frustrating time. It was simply difficult to do my work from home when the call for vaccinations came. At the beginning, I was a bit reluctant, thinking and with the passing of days, the lockdown continues. So I thought that in this way, I would not be able to go out